This is Still a Part of Us, a podcast where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter Red, and in this episode of Advice and Encouragement from a Lost Mom, I chat with Aaron, whose son Henry was stillborn at 38 weeks due to a fetal maternal hemorrhage. By the way, you can hear Aaron's episode about the birth of her child on episode 66. Today, we discuss with Erin how she's taking her time to heal, especially since she had been working as a labor and delivery nurse at the time of Henry's birth. We also talk about how she figured out a way to deal with her anger and that she has learned to ask for help, especially if you don't feel safe or having suicidal thoughts. As a word of caution to our listeners, this discussion does contain emotional triggers of stillbirth and infant loss, and we want you to please always keep yourself emotionally and mentally healthy and please, please seek help if needed. Hope this helps someone out there today. We are here once again with Aaron. We are so pleased to have you on again to chat about um, your son, Henry, and to get a little bit of advice and some a little bit of a glimpse into how things have looked since this last year when he passed away. So Aaron, thank you again for sharing Henry's birth story and for coming on today again. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's been delightful. I've just so enjoyed chatting with you and just a little bit of, so everybody knows where we're at. How, um, so your son, Henry, how long ago was he born? Um, he, it will be a year ago tomorrow, July 31st. Yep. So at the time of this recording, um, we're, we're basically at his first birthday and we are, that is, um, that's a big, that's a big monument right there. It's a big, um, big deal right there. So how has that looked for you, Aaron, this last year, one year since Henry was born? Yeah. It's crazy that it's a year. Um, it has been a roller coaster, uh, sometimes a nightmare, (laughs) incredibly difficult, a learning process. You know, a lot of people describe it as as waves, describe grief as waves, and I agree with that. I I did read in a book once, described it not as something that's linear, but like a like a spiral that kind of gradually moves up. Yeah. So you keep coming back to the same place, but each time you're a little bit higher or it's been a little bit longer since you've been in that spot. And that feels accurate for me. But um yeah, we've definitely learned that grief needs to be acknowledged and honored um, because the source of it is love, yeah. intense love. Oh, that's that's beautiful. Just that. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so glad you said that. Oh, uh, thanks. That is yeah. really, really like it does need to be acknowledged and um, it comes from your love of your child. I think that is just so beautiful and profound. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was a good lesson for me. Of course, the beginning of it is terrible, like just torture excruciating yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) like and there there is there's just a physical pain that's very present I I've heard um other women on the show talk about that you know like this ache in your chest and your arms ache they're supposed to be holding something and my stomach ached it felt empty and I felt like my bones were breaking and my lungs were full of glass you know it's just like the worst it's the worst feeling um I could ever possibly imagine, but thankfully that does ease with time. And now, you know, that we're at a year, I think I would describe it more like um, a heaviness, um, a weight that we just kind of carry each day. And it's a little less stabbing pain, Um, but it's, you know, definitely still a part of our everyday lives and the waves of sadness still come, but we're uh, familiar with them. (laughs) familiar with them. That's a, that's a good way of yeah. putting it. <laughs> yeah, anyway. We know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you, one thing that, oh, go oh, ahead, sorry, please go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, ask your question. <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask you, you guys came home from the hospital, you had your memorial, um, your funeral service for Henry. And that was, a, sounded like such a beautiful experience of you. Please reference um, Aaron's birth story of Henry. Cause that was just a super blessing. And the way she described it is so pretty. But I, I want to like, what, how did it even look just coming home from that even? Um, yeah. How was it just after? Cause I, I remember feeling like we were just floating. We just were not, we had no idea of time. We were so sad and just mopey, I guess. Um, yep. How are you, how are you guys doing? 
Um, yeah, I would say pretty similar to that. There's definitely a big shock time period of shock where it's like your brain doesn't really know what happened. I, I, I would have moments where I would be like, where's the baby? Or, you know, you think you hear the baby crying or something like that. So that was strange. I, I think it definitely took a few months for the shock to totally wear off. Paul, thankfully, took a month off from work. Mm, okay. um, so we were home together for a month, which was great. And we had a lot of friends who wanted to support us, um, which is good, but can also be overwhelming. So we tried to like space it out. We would have someone visit every other day. Mm. And so maybe they would just drop off some food or maybe they would hang out for a little bit and talk. Um, I remember being surprised at how much I was okay with talking to people and people were like, wow, you're really opening up. Like you're not isolating yourself. And, but that didn't come till later <laughs> because I think I was still in the shock phase. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how it looked. We just tried to find the daily schedule routine. We tried to go for a walk. I'd try to write in my journal, things like that. We lived a pretty low key life for a while. And that's necessary sometimes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you took some sort of um, maternity FMLA from work as well. Is that right? Yeah. So my, I had been planning to take 12 weeks and I did actually try to go back to work after that point. Um, and I worked two and a half shifts maybe. And I just realized that it wasn't possible for me to be there on the maternity unit. I felt a lot of anger and jealousy mm -hmm. and like, why is your baby alive? And mine isn't. I, I just felt like I couldn't be a good nurse to those women that deserved to have a good nurse. And it kind of made me feel pan panicky. And so I was like, this isn't a good idea. So um, thankfully, my manager was incredibly, incredibly supportive and was like, you have a job here whenever you want it. Yeah. Like you take as much time as you need. And the another higher up person in our hospital actually wrote me an email and said, if you find that you can't return to maternity, I will help you find a nursing job in any other unit in our hospital. Like I've just had so much support for that. So wow. I, um, I haven't gone back to the hospital. It's been a year and I haven't gone back to the hospital. Um, my plan is to try again starting next year and see okay. how it goes. But I, I was actually about to try again. And then the whole COVID thing started and I was like, maybe I don't want to be in the hospital right now. Oh, good idea. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, I've just been taking it really slow and try to focus on healing, you know, really take the time to mourn and grieve and heal and not run away from it or distract myself. And it's been a good process for me. Good. And I'm grateful that we're in a position to do that because I know not everybody is. But we've tried really hard to just feel the feelings when they come, you mm -hmm. know, as painful as it is to just let that wave wash over you and express the feelings, whether it's you know, crying or whatever. In the beginning, it was multiple times a day, just sobbing, but, uh, you know, it's spaced out now. But the one that I really struggled with was anger. Mm. That was, yeah. it showed up after about a month or two. And I've never really been an angry person. So it was very uncomfortable feeling and unfamiliar. Like I could be sitting in a room talking to people and all I could think about was smashing everything like I just wanted to smash the windows and the glass and the tv and scream and it took so much self-control to just be holding that in all the time yeah you know it was it was exhausting and I felt crazy but anger is yeah. part of that it's just I mean yeah you just can't help but feel mad about not yeah. having your child there so it's totally understandable it's understandable yeah that was a, it was a tough one and so I did want to mention a couple of things that helped me in case yeah. any other women um, find themselves feeling that way. <laughs> so I have a very amazing therapist, a psychologist who's incredibly helpful. And she talked to me about, you know, there's kind of a, an argument on, is it good to really give vent to anger um, because it could maybe make things worse sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but because I'm not naturally an angry person, we decided to trial some ways of expressing it, some physical ways, oh, okay. and, and to see if it helped at all. So uh, one thing we did, my aunt, uh, my very special aunt that I'm close with, um, she has a cabin in the woods here in Maine, and she took me there, and she told me to bring a bunch of glass jars and vases. <laughs> 
yeah and she had so yeah she had some um big burlap sacks and big thick pieces of plywood and some plastic pipes and some tires and she dropped me off there and said she'd be back in an hour <laughs> and she said to just do whatever you need to do to let your anger out and it felt so strange like what am I doing <laughs> But when you oh, got going, was it great? But when I got going, yeah, I was like, oh, this anger is there. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. So I tried a few different things. Um, I put the, I put the vases in the burlap sack and I would just smack it against the plywood as hard as I could. And um, mason jars were the best, actually, because they wouldn't immediately shatter. Yeah. They like you, you could hit them over and over before they broke. Yeah. So that was pretty great. <laughs> and Noted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stock up on a few big mason uh-huh. jars. And she had this like plastic pipe and there was a tree that had a pretty pretty nice branch like about shoulder height and I just ended up hitting it over and over and over um and and screaming. I just let myself scream. I thought for sure someone was going to show up with the police thinking some woman's being murdered in the woods, you know, but <laughs> thankfully nobody did, but I just screamed and I whacked on that tree and I cried for my baby. And I remember feeling like I understood why people in other countries wail Wail. when someone dies. You know, it felt like that's what I was doing. And it seemed like the most appropriate thing to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And and then eventually I was done and I, I sat down and I cried and I prayed and I felt a release and it felt better. And I didn't feel that anger again for several weeks. Um, so that felt really good. And when I did feel it again, I kind of had an idea of what to do. My husband took me for a walk in the woods and I found a big, strong branch and whacked it against some trees. And, you know, that physical expression yes, really helped. Yeah, it really does. Really, really helped. <laughs> yeah. And then um, one of our friends found out about it and he bought me some boxing gloves <laughs> and like one of those punching pads yeah. that Paul could hold. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, it worked out pretty good. The one thing I would say to be careful of, I did try this was to just go for a drive, like park somewhere isolated and just let yourself scream, you know, or uh-huh. hit the hit the steering wheel or whatever. That was working pretty good, except I did end up hitting my rear view mirror and a large crack formed in my windshield. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Just be careful if that's what you're going to do. <laughs> that's the weak spot. We had to replace our windshield, but thankfully my husband wasn't too upset about it. But... Oh, but uh, some yeah. really good ideas, though, if you need to get that out. I know I was just talking to somebody else and she's like, I have really gotten into running because I feel like I can pound yeah. my anger out on the pavement. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly how it feels when you run. Sometimes yep. you can just get, yeah, you can run angry, <laughs> angry run. <laughs> Angry run, for yeah. sure. I totally did that also, um, which is not super comfortable immediately postpartum, but yeah, <laughs> a little totally, later it totally. can be good. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's just really important to acknowledge that emotion just as much as sadness mm-hmm. and journaling did not get the anger out for me, mm. you know, that it, it just didn't work. Um, and I learned that sometimes when I was feeling that anger, it was because I was trying to push myself to do something that my body and brain wasn't ready for. It was like a Mm. signal, like back off a little bit and maybe you need to have a good cry or something like that. So, um, yeah, just definitely learning to honor that emotion as well was, was pretty important. That's great. That was some good advice from your um, therapist. I was like, that was a good idea. (laughs) I know. And she said, she's like, if you reach a point where you feel like it's getting worse, you need to stop. Yes. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Here's your counting points. Here are your parameters. <laughs> yes, for sure. And then the other piece I would say of the grieving process that was probably the hardest for us, which I haven't heard a lot of people on your show talk about it yet. So I don't know if it's okay to talk about, but Let's hear it. I, I really just wanted to die. I had no desire to be alive. Um, the pain was so bad. It just felt like torture. And I kept expecting my body to just stop working. It seemed like that's what was supposed to happen. Um, but it didn't, my body just kept working. And I was like, why is my body working when there's so much pain? Like it felt like if I could trans, if I could transform my emotional pain into physical pain, it would, I would be dead. Yeah, you'd be dead. Or, or they would put me in a medically induced coma. Cause it's not humane to allow someone to have that much right. pain, you know? Right. 
So, um, so that was really hard. I really struggled with wanting to die. And I think the biggest thing I want to say about that is you don't have to be ashamed of that. Like I remember my therapist said, you've gone through one of the worst tragedies any human could experience and wanting to not be alive because of that pain is completely normal, but it's really important to talk about yeah, and not just like keep it inside. And so that's what I would say. I didn't keep those thoughts and feelings to myself. I told my husband, I told my therapist, I had a couple of close friends that helped me kind of monitor the intensity of it, you know, and mm-hmm. she helped me, my therapist helped me understand that like, those feelings can be tolerated and they can pass, but you want to have a safety plan in place. Yeah. So that's what we did. You know, when Paul went back to work, I, every day he was at work, I had a friend set up to come be with me for part of the day and I felt stupid at first, like I needed a babysitter or something, but it's just, that's what we needed to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> when you feel like you want to die, I, so I, I was actually going to ask So did you have suicidal thoughts or was it just more of a, I just want to die? It was a very generic thing. It wasn't, or was there some like, oh, I could, you know, I'm right. making plans. Yeah. To- for me, <laughs> it built gradually over time for me. Um, at first it was very generic thoughts. Like I want to be with Henry. I don't want to be alive, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And then it started shifting into ways that I could die. And and then every day, my brain was coming up with a new way to die. And it was scary. It was yeah. a very scary feeling. Yeah. And it just consumed my thoughts. Like one day we were driving down the road and they always, um, in our town, they always plant these really beautiful flowers in the in the median strip of the road. And I remember thinking, that would be a really beautiful place to just lay down and die. And then I thought, you know, I don't think mentally healthy people would have that thought. (laughs) That's a little concerning. But acknowledging it, knowing and seeing that, yeah, maybe I'm not in a good place. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, so it did eventually turn pretty serious for me. And we, like I said, I had several friends that were all pregnant at the same time as me. Um, one of them was one of my best friends, actually, and we both didn't know the gender of our baby, and she was due about seven weeks after me. And uh, so Henry died, and then shortly after, on one of her ultrasounds, they saw something that was kind of concerning, and they decided to induce her early. Mm-hmm. And that in itself was really hard for me to handle. Like, oh, they saw something on her ultrasound, so her baby's going to be born safe, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, And then the day her baby was born and it was a boy, it just um, shattered me. It just shattered me. That was one of the hardest days. And I remember we were driving home on the highway Mm -hmm. and every cell in my body was just telling me to open the door and jump out. And it was awful. The pain was just so bad. And But every time that happened, there was this little tiny voice inside of my head that said, say something to Paul tell Paul what you're thinking. And then the other voice, which was much louder, was like, no, don't say anything to Paul. Then you can do what you want to do and be done with it. But I remember I I whispered to Paul, I want to, I want to jump out of the car. I'm trying really hard to not jump out of the car. And he held my hand really tight. And he told me to lay my head down on his arm so that I couldn't see the other cars. And he locked the doors and he put some calm music on and we drove home and he helped me into the house and I just laid on the bed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and told him how much I wanted to die. And he just took such good care of me. And we had a rating system in place. Yeah. <laughs> this might sound kind of No, funny, no, no. But... Tell me about it. I want to hear about it. <laughs> so you know how people say like, uh-oh, we're at DEFCON 5 or whatever, <laughs> like like a, an alarm system? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to come up with an alarm system so that he could check in and see how I was doing. So I think DEFCON 1 was like, oh, I feel kind of crappy, but I'm not unsafe. And um, DEF 2 was like, okay, if you're working, maybe someone should just call me at some point during the day, but I'm okay to be alone. And 3 was someone should probably be in the house with me, but I'm okay like to be in a room by myself. 4 was don't leave me alone in a room by myself. And 5 was take me to the hospital. Okay. 
So that was our rating because I didn't always feel like I could fully describe what I was feeling. So he would just say like, where are we at? What's our rating at? And I would just be like, okay, three, I'm at a three. And he's like, okay, so we'll have someone hang out with you today, you know, or whatever. (laughs) So what a smart idea. Just having, it's almost like a secret code so that you, yeah, it doesn't have to be explained. You just know where you're at and you are honest with each other. Like, that's great. Yeah, it worked really, really well for us. And um, I would like to say that that just eventually passed. But for me, it did end up building to a a peak. And so we did reach DEFCON 5 one night. And so we went to the hospital. And that was really, really hard. And I met with the you know, the therapist at the, in the emergency room and she's, she was so compassionate and empathetic and was just like, you poor honey, I can't even believe what you've been through. And after talking to her about what I was feeling and, and, and thinking, she said, I think maybe you should stay with us for a little while. And yeah, and that was the right decision for me. I'm really glad we did that, even though it was hard and it was humbling yeah (laughs) you know but it was good it was good for you to be safe and yeah yeah it was good and I remember the nurse who admitted me that night he said you do not need to feel ashamed he said we are all just one bad day away from needing some time here (laughs) yep and that helped me feel better you know he really validated that what I had been through was horrific and they were going to help me and he said Aaron we're not going to let you go home still wanting to die and I was like, well, buddy, I'm going to be here for a long time. Then <laughs> This happens kind of regularly for me. <laughs> yeah, this is like a daily thing for the past few months. So I don't know what your plan is. But uh, so it actually wasn't that long. I stayed there for about nine days. And um, it was hard in some ways. You know, I missed Paul, of course, because we'd been together right. so much. But it was also a huge relief. I felt... I didn't have to use up so much energy all day to keep myself safe. I was safe. Yeah. They were going to, they were keeping an eye on you. They were keeping me safe and I could just breathe. Mm -hmm. I could just be there. And, and they did start me on some medication, which was another really hard, humbling thing, um, which I had been resisting up to that point, but, but it did help. Yeah. It did help. It helped me be able to get some sleep, which mm-hmm. I hadn't been sleeping good since Henry died. And that made a big difference. And then when I was discharged from the hospital, they had an outpatient program that I went to for a few weeks that really helped. It taught me a lot of different skills for managing difficult emotions um, and doing stuff like that. So I would just say, you know, don't be afraid to ask for that help. Like yeah. you deserve it and it's out there. Yeah. And you know, when people get hit by a car, they go to the hospital. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we've been through something just as traumatic and, and it's okay to get the help you need. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. And that was a really good lesson for me to learn. Thank you for sharing that. That is, yes, we have not talked about that a lot. I've had a couple people mention that they didn't want it to die, but they did not expound on that too much. So thank you for sharing that. That yeah. is that is um, extremely, like you said, humbling to to share something because it feels there's a lot of stigma around um, that and people don't want to share it. So thank you. Yeah, it's hard. And actually, just a few months ago, I a girl that I had met on Facebook whose baby died, she, she did take her life. And yeah. it was just a huge reminder to me, like losing your baby changes everything everything you know like it's the worst thing a mother could ever go through yeah and and we need to really support each other during this time and I think you know this podcast is so great for that just being able to hear other people's stories and what has helped and and how friends can help you know so I would say if if your friend had lost their baby and they're talking about you know I just want to die don't shy away from that like let them have that conversation with you and and talk about it and find out like are these just fleeting feelings do you have a plan what can we what can we do to keep you safe because we want you to be here and these feelings will eventually pass yeah yeah and there's there's help and there are things that will help i mean whether that's counseling yeah. medications etc i um it's appropriate in certain times and it sounds like you, even though that was hard for you to start some medication or you know that type of thing that it was appropriate for this time um, for you to help you. Yeah, it was the right decision. Yeah. 
So thank you very much for sharing that. That is so important. And so, um, yeah, we do need to talk about it more, especially when you're all of your emotions are going crazy still, right? Yeah. And then you add the grief and the sadness and the depression and the trauma that comes with your loss. It's just, it sometimes is overwhelming and too much, too much. Yeah. You just need some help. You just need some help. And that's okay. You, that's, and that's okay. Yeah. It's totally good to to be okay and let people help you because yeah. there are so many wonderful people that are willing to help you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so as we kind of talk about this, um, I, I so you didn't go back to work and I, I'm assuming a lot of your coworkers probably reached out to you though after oh, yeah. mm-hmm. after this loss because um, mm-hmm. it sounds like you're so so close to each other. Was that helpful to hear from them? Was that hard? Because I you also mentioned there was a lot of them that were pregnant or had had babies recently. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had a great support system, both through my work and also through our congregation, um, just like so many people <laughs> did so many things that were so helpful. And like I said, food, it was a huge one, <laughs> which you've mentioned, you know, just like just feed people that's yeah. what they need they just do not want to cook so <laughs> bring something cook. over Go to the grocery store yeah. that's ridiculous yeah. yeah so i mean people bought us freshly made meals or frozen meals or a gift card for takeout you know things like that we got cards all the time like so many cards i've saved every single card that we've received in a special box in henry's room and i reread them you know when i'm feeling down and i remember probably around four months after he died, we were still getting cards and I prayed, please don't let these cards stop. Like I, I still need it. Please let them keep coming. And and they did. Good. Good. So, so keep it going. I mean, I would say that too. Like if, if you know, a friend has lost a baby, sure. Send a card in the first week, but send a card at month six, you know, send a card at nine months and just be like, we're still thinking about you. We're still we still love you and we're, we're still grieving with you. That helped me a lot. And, and my friends that had babies, that was a very difficult thing. It was very difficult for me because I wanted to feel happy for them, but I felt, like I said, so much anger and um, jealousy. And that was very uncomfortable feeling for me. And also I knew that they wanted to be comforting me. But those aren't the people that can comfort you, you know, like the people who's not at that time. And so um, what I would say is that I'm very grateful for those people in my life giving me the space Mm. that I needed and respecting that they had what we lost and that that was painful for us. And um, yeah, they've been really great. Like even still at this point, I'm not really close with any of them, which is really hard. It's been like a collateral loss in my life. Um, But I still get text messages from some of them sometimes like, please don't feel any pressure. Just want you to know we love you and are thinking of you. And um, so I think that's a good way to handle it. If you happen to be someone who had a baby right around the time that someone lost a baby, just not feeling the need to push yourself into their life to comfort them so that you feel like you're doing a good job. But by giving them space, you could be helping them heal. Yeah. Because it's just painful reminders. I like that giving them space and, but also just reaching out and saying, "Hey, love you. I know this. Yeah, just this sucks, and I'm sorry that we're in this kind of situation, but extending that love anyway. I like that. Yeah, yeah. That was. I mean, it's been a big help, and you know, a lot of people just said, like, if you need anything, Mm -hmm. please tell us. And so we tried to really take advantage of that. You know, I feel like in our society, we're very much like we can take care of ourselves and we don't need any help. And this is the time to call in all your resources. Yeah, (laughs) Just just use it. And like, I'll just tell one story that cracked us up. But so I, I don't know what happened. Somehow I lost my balance you know, you're doing all this stuff postpartum and you've got pads and squirt bottles. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all it's not pretty. Stuff. <laughs> it's not dignified when you're trying to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I lost my balance and I fell on the toilet seat and it cracked. It oh. disconnected from the toilet. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> and I was like, 
are you kidding me right now? I've just broke my toilet. Like my self-esteem just plummeted. <laughs> yeah. And so then I'm like, how are we supposed to fix the toilet? I don't even know. Like, where do you, do you buy a new toilet seat? How do you? Is that a I thing? I, I couldn't. My brain couldn't come up with a solution to that. And so I texted a friend and I said, you want to help me? I just broke my toilet seat. <laughs> Can you fix that for me? <laughs> that is great. And they're like, they're like, we are on it. And they asked us a couple of questions and they went to Lowe's and they picked out a toilet seat and they came over and they installed it. And I was just like, you guys don't even know like what a big deal that was. So just, <laughs> just little things. Little things. Oh, oh make know. the biggest difference. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> I sent them a thank you card later and I said, you guys really saved our butt. <laughs> <laughs> I but they were, good I, fun. <laughs> I, my main point is don't be afraid to take people up on their offers to help because they mean it. And sometimes people just don't know what to do, but they feel good if you can give them something to do and then it helps you. Yeah, exactly. Very specific and, it, and wow, it makes a huge difference. So yes, yeah, people are so generous and so kind, but they really just need a little direction. <laughs> Yeah, just help. give them a little direction. Yeah. And the friends of I, you know, I want to just say a big shout out to the friends who stayed with me on those days Paul was working, yeah. you know, when I was not feeling safe. That was a really, that was a really nice thing and didn't make me feel like we needed to be talking the whole time or something like that. You know, they're just like, I'm here. I've got a book. I've got some food. If you want to interact, we can, but we don't have to. It's just like, that was really helpful too. Yeah, that time and no expectations either. That's that yeah, so helpful. That yeah. you have good friends, friend. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> good. We are very grateful for our friends. Yeah, one of our friends, the one that did the flowers for the funeral. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, people give you so many flowers, yeah. which is just awesome and beautiful. But they all die. Yeah, they <laughs> like do. The flowers all die. And so I had mentioned to this friend, like, I love all these flowers. They're so beautiful. But it's so sad when they all die. I wish I just had like flowers that didn't die and her and her family got us this gorgeous bouquet bouquet of fake flowers oh and they're just so beautiful they look so real and they put them in this beautiful vase with stones in the bottom and we've had them ever since the funeral they're in the living room and they're gorgeous and I was like what a great gift idea it, it is that is so, a great So there's idea. an idea. You yeah. want to buy someone flowers? Buy them some flowers that aren't going to die. Yeah. It's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I had, we had so many people give us plants and I, I feel like I have a, my Brannon garden, <laughs> just all, yeah. all the plants I received, we received from um, when he passed away. So I'm, yeah, awesome. so grateful. So grateful for those people that thought of that. Um, yeah. So hopefully that gives people some ideas, yeah. things to do. Those were the things we really appreciated. Oh, good. Anything on the uh, opposite end of things, uh, is there anything that you would recommend people not say or do that was, hmm. um, that, that could have, you could have done without, <laughs> you don't have to, don't yeah. call anybody out, just, you know. Right. Yeah. I think, um, you know, everybody's just always trying to find something to say that's comforting and sometimes it's just a little bit thoughtless. Yeah. So, you know, a few things people said to me that. And God will bless you with another child. And it's like, well, that's not going to be the child I lost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wanted that um, one. Yeah. Or I know how you feel. I had a couple of miscarriages and it's like, yeah, I had a miscarriage too. And that is very devastating, but it's not the same as giving birth to a dead child. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. So that I would say, be careful with the phrase, I know how you feel, like yeah. with making a comparison. Yeah. Um, and uh, one person said time heals all wounds, which I think is just like a generic thing that people say. But there is a void in your life that's never going to be filled. You, you learn to adapt to living with it. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that it heals necessarily. You know, grief is a lifelong process. So I would, yeah, just be careful with, with stuff like that. And, and don't say nothing. That's the other thing that's really hard. We did have, unfortunately, a person in my family that has no longer spoken to us. And, oh. um, and that's been incredibly hard for me. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But so 
Hmm. Yes, it's it's uncomfortable for everyone. We all know that it's uncomfortable for everyone. But don't pretend nothing happened. Yeah. Don't avoid them for months. Like it's just gonna get worse. Just yeah. just make the effort. Say, I'm so sorry for what happened. It's really awful. We love you guys. Is there anything we can do? You know, that's all you have to say. Mm-hmm. Just some sort of acknowledgement. So, some acknowledgement. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's what I would say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always see common themes, and that's that's a pretty common one. Don't don't ignore it. Um, don't think because that's a yeah. that's a big deal. That's something big just happened, and you yeah, can't just ignore it. So, Paul sounds awesome. He seems to really know you and has taken good care of you. How has he handled the loss of Henry? Oh, Paul is just amazing. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'm going to let him talk about his own grieving process I won't get into it too much but we have learned like a lot of people have said we don't grieve the same way and um, it's kind of like we're on parallel paths but they're separate Mm, you know Um, so we have found how we have learned how to support each other wherever we're at in the moment maybe one of us is feeling angry or needs to cry and the other one doesn't so just holding space for that mate to feel what they need to feel just being present with them in that moment and um and it'll always come back you know we'll always end up doing it for the other person and and being really patient with each other and considerate because your threshold for things is a lot lower you know Mm -hmm. we tried really hard not to snap at each other and just like if we felt that building just being like I need a second Mm -hmm. I'm feeling a lot of emotions right now it's not directed at you (laughs) just just need a timeout myself real quick. <laughs> I need a timeout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and so that's been helpful. And I think also recognizing that we both need separate things mm. to to grieve and to feel better and to, you know, and like so for me, that means making sure Paul has time to exercise or mm. to be with his parents or to play the piano. Like those are good things for him. So trying to support that he has time to do that. Yeah. And for me, Paul has kept me safe. He's kept mm-hmm. me safe and he has held me for hours while I've cried and, you know, make sure I get enough sleep and stuff like that. So figuring out like, what is it that the other person really needs? It's not going to be the same thing I need, but how can I show up for them too? Yeah. How can you show up? That's, that's a good question to ask yourself when, yeah, with your partner. That's important. I'm really just... grateful. He's been, he's been amazing. It's not something any couple ever wants to go through, no. but it can It can strengthen your relationship if you work at it. Yeah, exactly. It can break your relationship real easy. So, so easy, I think. But yeah, if you... And that's common, right? I mean, that's what we talked about after was like, this could ruin our marriage. Mm -hmm. We can't pull away from each other. Yeah. You know, we we, we have to do this together. Let's stick together. So, yeah. That's good that, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I'm so, so glad to hear that. Do you guys have any plans to celebrate Henry's birthday tomorrow? So we had, we came up with three things we wanted to do. Um, So we don't celebrate birthdays in the typical way that um, other people do. Yes, that's correct. But (laughs) but is there any way you're going to yeah do something special that day regardless? Yeah, do something to honor him as this time was getting closer. So we decided on three things. Um, We planted a tree. Uh, which a friend had offered to buy for us last year, but I just like wasn't in the mental space Mm -hmm. to figure it out. So we planted a tree this year, a weeping cherry tree with the help of our landlord, who's just been amazing. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that's our Henry tree. And we put a little bit of his ashes in the soil when we planted it. And so that feels really good. And I water it every other day and I go out there and sit on the bench and water it. And it feels like I'm kind of I don't know, mothering him in a certain way. Yeah, (laughs) nurturing and taking care of him. Yeah. Yeah. And then I decided I wanted to do this podcast, which turned out to be you were available right in the week of the year. It worked out really good. It worked out really well. (laughs) And then the third thing we decided to do, which won't happen this week, actually, but um, I, I was very fortunate to be able to go on a retreat just about two months after Henry died, a retreat for mothers who had lost babies. Oh, okay. And I was able to connect with, I think it was nine other women and it was incredibly helpful. Oh my goodness. Just connecting with other women 
who were further out in the process than mm-hmm. I was, was hugely helpful. And um, so the woman who was the farthest out from her loss, she was about, her loss was about 16 years ago, and she's had four other children since then. She helps run a nonprofit organization that works with families going through loss. And one of the things that she does is go to maternity units and train nurses how to provide the best care for families going through a stillbirth. That is great. And it's awesome. And so I decided I would really love for her to do a training session at our hospital. Even though I I felt like I did receive excellent care from my coworkers, I know as a nurse that whenever a patient comes in with a loss, you're like, oh man, you know, it's just really scary. Like, how can I be the best nurse for this family going through this tragedy? And to to have some really good training under your belt, I think would help us do a better, a better service to the women in our community. So I was like, oh, I would really love to have her come and do a training session. And so I reached out to my manager and talked to her about it. And she said, we have all been trying to think of something to do this month to honor Henry. (laughs) She's like, so this is great. And she talked to the, you know, the VP and they got the funding for it and they are setting up dates for it, which I think it'll probably be in September. And I'm just like, oh, everyone at work is all, all behind it. And it just feels so, so good. That yeah. is so good. That, cause that, that will help so many families, like yeah, so many families. Cause it's such an awful, awful, awful time. This will be wonderful. Yeah, it made me really excited to feel like, to make sure more women will get taken care of in a really good way during that super yeah. difficult time. That's so cool. That's really... Yeah, so those are the three things we decided to do for this year. And and actually, thanks to your podcast, I already have my plan for next year. Oh, I have some ideas. Oh, good. I'm so <laughs> glad. I really am so glad. I hope, hopefully it'll be a nice way to honor him and celebrate him. Yeah. Erin, this has been so delightful. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us that you've done for your remembrances of of your sweet Henry or anything, any advice that you want to give anybody? Yeah, I do have a couple other things I was hoping to say. Let's do Um, it. Let's talk. One thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the milk. Oh. We didn't touch on the milk thing. (laughs) Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Oh, let's talk about the milk. So, so I am a breastfeeding counselor. Okay. And I teach breastfeeding classes and I have helped tons of women learn how to breastfeed and learn how to pump and, you know, in all different kinds of circumstances. And Mm -hmm. I was, I was just, I'm fascinated by the way our bodies do this. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I was so looking forward to doing it myself. And pretty much the minute he was born, I decided I'm going to pump my milk. Mm, I'm going to, I'm going to pump it. And eventually I will donate it. I wanted to see if my body could still make the milk. Yeah. Even though I felt like, you know, something in my body didn't work right because Henry's not alive, but Mm -hmm. maybe this part will work right. It felt like it could be kind of comforting. Mm -hmm. So I started that day while we were in the hospital and drops of milk came mm-hmm. and I cried and I took the little drops of milk and I rubbed them on Henry's lips and oh. I rubbed them on his cheeks and and it was really amazing and I have one I have an excerpt in my journal that I wrote about it that I really wanted to read is that okay please do okay I said we got home and over the next two days I made more and more milk <laughs> I got so full it poured out of me such a gorgeous color like nothing I'd ever seen before. A brilliant orangey yellow like warm sunshine flowing out of my body for my dear son. But instead it went in bottles and bags in the freezer. But it still brought me joy and comfort. I felt connected to Henry. I felt proud that this part of my body was working and wasn't a broken failure. I showed off my milk to everyone who came over. <laughs> Which was actually pretty funny. I people would come over and be like, "Look at my milk!" And I would pull these bags out of the freezer, and some of the women would be like, "That's so cool!" And some of the men were like, "That's weird." <laughs> oh come but on, man! I was, just, I was so proud of it, and um, and so then I so I pumped for a few weeks, and then all of a sudden something changed, and it just didn't feel good anymore, mm. and I wanted to stop. And you can't just immediately stop once your breasts are full on 
yeah. making milk. So I had to, I had to wean it down. And part of weaning it down means pumping for less time, shutting off the pump, even if there's still milk coming out. Yeah. And that was really hard for me that, you know, shutting it off while there's still milk flowing. I felt like it felt like I was rejecting Henry. Like I was mm. like, I didn't want to maintain that connection to him, but but that's not what I was doing. So I, I had this little thing I would do where I would say out loud, Henry, I love you. And milk, I love you. And breasts, I'm proud of you. <laughs> and I wish I could give this milk to you, Henry. But but mommy needs to accept the reality that you're not here right now, that I need to heal. And that means I need to sleep. And I would cry for a minute. And then I would shut the pump off. And so I had this little ritual that I did every time. And yeah, so it eventually it, it went away. Um, but I just felt so much pride in that milk. Like I grew this beautiful baby boy and I was able to produce this beautiful milk and it was just so cool. I really yeah. loved it. And I, I've heard so many stories of women who have lost their babies and kind of feel like, oh my goodness, the milk coming in, like, this is just a slap in the face you know like yeah. what can't my body tell that my baby's not here and yeah. not make me have to deal with this yeah but for me it was a really beautiful thing and I'm really glad I decided to pump it and so I just want to make sure that women know that that's an option yeah. and um I ended up finding a really really nice family a mom with twin boys who wasn't making enough milk and we gave it to them oh, and good. it was super special and um, I'm just really grateful for the, the time I had to do that. I remember it wasn't necessarily easy all the time. Of um, course, yeah. Once, once your breasts are full, that milk is just ready to come out. And I remember one time I was trying to get the stupid flange on the bottle and get it all hooked up. And of course. <laughs> the milk is just, just starts pouring out of me. And I, was, I just started crying and I just felt like, I felt like my whole body was just crying for Henry, you know, mm. like this fluid leaking out but yeah yeah anyways it was really special and actually I said a little secret special prayer that I would really love it if I could just keep my milk until I make another baby so that the same milk it would be the same milk that yeah. my body had made for Henry because even after I stopped pumping I could very easily just like get a drop of milk to come right by squeezing my breast yeah and that didn't that didn't go away for months and months oh. and um and so now here I am I'm six months pregnant and I can still bring drops of milk out and this hopefully I really really hope this little baby's gonna get to drink this milk and she'll be connected to her brother in that way and oh. that feels really special that's that is so special that is so beautiful like to think of that <laughs> oh I like oh yeah that's you know, I and Aaron, I'll be honest. I, I was, I was, I did feel like when my milk started to come in that that was a slap in the face, and, yeah, and super unfair. But I like what you did, how that felt really special and bonding to you, to Henry and and hopefully this little this little daughter that you're gonna have. I just ah, oh, that's. That gives me shivers. That's so cool that you decided yeah, to do that. And I saved a little tiny bit of the milk um, that I'm hoping to make like a, they make breast milk jewelry, you know, like oh. you can make a ring or something uh -huh. like that. So that's going to be my gift to myself eventually. Oh, but. That's, <laughs> that's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. So that was one thing I want to talk about yeah. was the milk. And then, um, oh, I think there was one other thing I wanted to say that, oh, so we had this elephant like a stuffed elephant that people had given us as a gift. And we brought it to the hospital with us and it was with Henry in his bassinet with him. And we actually had two people had, oh, wait a minute. Am I telling this story right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking of it. No, no. Okay. Yeah. We, so the, it was with Henry. And so um, when he went to the, what's the right word? Crematorium, I guess. I'm sure um, probably the mortuary. Don't they have mortuary? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What <laughs> I think of these like awful. Yeah. To, yeah. It's just not, don't, don't picture. Like yeah. Don't picture that. Yeah, no, <laughs> don't picture that. Not that. <laughs> when he went to the funeral home, the elephant went with him. Mm -hmm. And so then when we went back to pick up his ashes, um, they gave us the elephant back. And so it was like the last, the last thing that had been with Henry. And so we call him Henry Elephant and we mm -hmm. wrapped him in the blankets that Henry was wrapped in. And he, I felt this enormous urge to mother this little stuffed elephant. Yeah. 
Yeah, and no, I felt, yeah. I felt kind of crazy, but this book that we read, which has been super helpful, um, Empty Arms, Broken Cradle, Empty Cradle, Broken Heart, something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Super good book. Talked about you have to find ways to express those mothering urges and that that's okay. Like your mama heart was born and your baby, there's nobody there to be the recipient of it. So we mothered this little elephant, little Henry elephant, and he slept in bed with us and we read him books and we, I cried into him and we talked to him and I would bring him in the car with me and like, and now he sleeps in a little bassinet next to our bed wrapped in Henry's blanket. And it's been really, um, really comforting. And when I went to that retreat, I felt really embarrassed to show up with a stuffed animal. And every single one of the mothers there had an animal, a yeah. stuffed animal. And so that was really, really special. Yeah. And, um, I'm yeah, so glad. So don't feel bad about that. I, yeah, don't feel bad <laughs> about that either because I'm in the same camp because I was like... You are? Yeah, we totally have... So um, my husband, we, um, we described that he has purchased um, specific little stuffed animals for each of our kids. And before Brandon was even like we even knew it was a boy, he got this red panda for him. And mm-hmm. so I have a red panda, a little red panda stuffed animal. And Aww. and we call him Brandon. And I, it's yeah. just. It, oh, I that mean, makes me feel good. See, no, it's like so common. It, 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 it totally is. Because now I'm <laughs> Lee. It was funny because. When we knew Brandon passed away, he got on Amazon and purchased every single red panda that they have. Oh. <laughs> so we have several of them. <laughs> good. You got some backup. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. So I oh, I think really it's, uh, yeah, you're totally right. I think there, you you want to mother, you want to nurture, you want to care for your child and your child is not there yeah. and that sucks. And so you need to, yeah, you need to direct that energy and love towards towards something so that... Yeah, I think that works. Yes, I think Henry you're. Elephant. That's totally yeah. normal. Yeah, your Henry <laughs> elephant is totally normal, Aaron. <laughs> totally normal. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right, I'm almost done. I promise. Um, <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> one thing I want to say for friends of people who have lost a baby, mm-hmm. just talk about the baby. Like, say the baby's name. I love talking about Henry. Mm-hmm. I will bring him up as often as I possibly can. And I don't care if people are uncomfortable. Like you talk about your kids. Yeah. I'm going to talk about my kids. Yeah. And, you know, it warms my heart so much when someone's like, oh, I was thinking about Henry today. And, you know, to hear someone else say his name, like, oh, I wonder if Brandon would have liked this or something like that. Like, oh, it just fills your heart up. So just don't be afraid to do that. People are like, well, I don't want to bring it up in case it makes them sad. Like, guess what? That's probably all we're ever thinking about. So. Go and we're yeah, we're always going to be sad about not having our child, but gosh, it, yeah, it really does make you so happy when you're like, oh, that's my son's name. Yeah, that's my yeah. son. <laughs> it's so special. So I wanted to say that, and um, I also wanted to say, you know, you feel so bad for so long, and then you start to feel a little bit better, and then you feel guilty. Ugh. And I'm like, oh no, uh, today I didn't cry. Yeah. You know, or like something like that. Like, what is my love for him going away? Am I forgetting him? And yeah. I just went through this phase where I was like afraid to feel better because what did that mean? Yeah. You feel like you're betraying uh-huh. him and your love yeah. for him and you're going to forget him. It's awful. Yeah. So that was really hard. So don't be afraid. Don't be surprised if that comes up. And I, I hear people say a lot of times, like, it's okay to not be okay. And that's totally true. It's also okay to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's okay to be okay. As you start to have days where you feel better, that's all right. And it doesn't mean your love for your child is any less. It never will be. Yeah. So that was one thing. And then the last thing I want to say, this is the very last thing, <laughs> is someone very special wrote to me at some point. I don't remember when, honestly, but it helped me a lot. And so I'm hoping it helps somebody else too. She wrote, every one of us who has been conceived must at some point leave this world. Some will have many, many years. Others, their time will be brief. At some point during our time, we come to know sadness, pain, and fear, and we all come to know death. We might meet it surrounded by loved ones, or we might be totally alone. Here is something I want you to remember. Henry was never alone, not for one second of his existence. He was never sad. He was never in pain. 
He was never afraid. He spent his entire life being soothed by the sound of his mother's voice and her heartbeat. And when he met death, he did so while enveloped in an embrace from his mother's entire being. I can think of no way to meet the end more beautiful and comforting than that. I know that you mourn for all the moments that you and Paul wanted with your son, but perhaps you can find a small measure of comfort in remembering that from Henry's perspective, you were his entire world and his whole life was perfect. So that really helped me to think about. And so I just hope that maybe someone else will find comfort in that too. That is so beautiful. That is... (laughs) I'm choking up. I'm sorry. That was so beautiful. That, oh, what a, what beautiful words. Um, yeah. yeah. So it really touched me. You know, you just, you want to give your child the best life you possibly can. And when that life is cut short, sometimes you feel like you failed, but you can remember that you didn't choose for that life to be cut short. And for his whole entire life, you did. You gave him the very best. He had a perfect life growing inside of you. And you, you succeeded. Oh, that's yeah. so beautiful. That was a really special friend of yours, too. I was like, that is so yes. beautiful. I have some good friends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's. Thank you for sharing that. That was, I think that will help other people. I hope so. Yeah. And I hope your podcast, in some ways, I hope your podcast goes on forever. And in some ways, I hope you run out of having people to talk to. I, well, I know. Exactly. That's that's what we hope to. But it, I unfortunately think that's <laughs> Unless we yeah. make huge strides in something with stillbirth, I yeah, it's so it's here. But it's here. Yeah. We're here for each other. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very, very much for letting me talk for so long. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Uh it was it has been wonderful to hear from you for to hear your experience. I'm always so surprised at how different everybody's experience is. And and yeah. The births and, and how these babies have lived and passed away or they're also different, even though we have some sort of, we have a common bond of a loss, but it's so different. And so I appreciate you speaking from your point of view and from, especially from having your, your professional background that has been super helpful to hear what you've gone through and what you have done that is maybe different than I would do it or many other people would do it. But hopefully it'll give some ideas to some who are going through this, something to think about and, and rely on. Um, when they're going through this. So thank yeah, you, Erin. So. It's yeah. It was delightful chatting with you. <laughs> thank, thank you for you. coming you too. on. <laughs> I really, really appreciate it. Wasn't that such a great conversation with Erin? It was she just had just wonderful words of advice and I really, really appreciate her sharing with us today, sharing her son Henry with us, her experiences, and I, I just feel like I learned so, so much from Erin. So thank you, Erin, for your time today. Along with that, I also want to say to reiterate with Aaron what Aaron said, please keep yourself safe. And if you have a lost mom or dad in your life who is really struggling, please be in touch with them often so they can keep themselves safe and, and try and help them in different ways, intervening, um, checking in on them. Please, please keep our, please keep your loved ones safe. Head over to our website, stillapartofus.com, where you can find the show notes of this interview and any resources that were mentioned, where you can sign up for our short and helpful email newsletter, and also how you can learn to become a patron and support the work that it takes to produce this show for just a few dollars a month. And lastly, where you can find out how to get in touch with us if you want to share your child's story on the show. The show was produced and edited by Winter and Lee Red. Thanks to Josh Woodward for letting us use his song, Vanishing Note. You can find him at joshwoodward.com. Lastly, subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. This is how most people find us and um, it really is a great help to those who have been through this. So we just want everybody to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they are still a part of us. Style is a way to say who you are without having to speak. Rachel Zoe